This talk is about sphere packings in eight dimensions and about the problem of what is the best sphere packing in eight dimensions. And this problem was solved a few years ago by work of Henry Cohn and Noam Elkies and Marina Vyazovska. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is, is describe their work. So as background, let's take a look at the following problem. What is the best sphere packing in n dimensions? And um, in, a, in small dimensions, this is pretty obvious. So in dimension one, the sphere packing is completely trivial. Um, a, a ball is just going to be a unit interval. And the best way to pack unit intervals into um, one dimensional space is kind of utterly trivial. For n equals two, it's pretty obvious what the answer is. You pack spheres like this. And then we can have another row like that. And we get a sort of hexagonal close packing. And for n equals three, um, the, the, the problem of the best way to pack spheres is a famous problem known as the Kepler problem or Kepler conjecture. There's a pretty obvious way to do it, to pack spheres. So um, if I put a green spot at the center of these circles. We can think of these circles as being a, um, spheres and I want to stack another layer of spheres above them so I can put spheres in the gaps. But there are actually two ways of doing this because either, I, I can either put them in these gaps here or I can put them in these gaps. So um, if I call the green gaps sphere of positions A, then I can put the call the orange gaps B and the pink gaps type C. So um, th there are two choices for where I put the second layer of spheres. And similarly, there are two choices for the third layer of spheres. So I can describe any sphere packing by giving a sequence of letters such as A, B, A, C, B, A, B, C and so on, provided I don't use the same letter twice in a row. So for example, if I just pack them like A, B, A, B, A, B, this gives something called hexagonal close packing. And if I pack them as A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, this gives us face centered cubic. And one of the things that makes the Kepler problem so difficult is there are huge numbers of optimal solutions. I mean, somewhere if there's only one optimal solution, it's usually much easier to prove it's optimal. So the Kepler problem was finally solved a few years ago by Hales. And his proof is incredibly complicated. It used huge amounts of computer calculation. And when it was sent for refereeing, the, the referees basically said, well, we can't, we think it's correct, but we can't really tell it's correct because the calculations are so difficult. So it was eventually published. Um, we can actually describe the ABC, ABC packing explicitly as follows. The centers of the spheres consist of all the points N1, N2, N3 in three dimensional space such that all the NI are integers and the sum of the ni is even. If you take all the ni integers, this, this just gives you a sort of cubical packing, which isn't terribly efficient. But if you remove half the points, it becomes much better. So n equals three is a horribly complicated problem that was sort of taxed the resources of um, mathematics to prove. N equals four, as far as anyone knows, is even more difficult. And N equals five is harder still, and N equals six is presumably even harder, and N equals seven is even worse. And N equals eight was actually solved by Marina Vyazovska um, a few years ago, and it's her solution that I want to describe. So it's, it's really bizarre that we, we, we don't know how to solve these low dimensional cases, but we can do this funny eight dimensional case. Um, so 
what actually is the best sphere packing in eight dimensions? Well, it's something called the E8 packing. And this can be described as follows. The centers of the spheres in eight dimensions are given by taking all, in, all coordinates n1, n2, up to n8 in R8, with all ni in z, except you then throw away half of them. So just as in the three-dimensional case, we take the sum of the ni to be even. But then we, th th there's enough room to add another bunch of spheres. We can take all things with n1 plus a half, n2 plus a half, and so on up to n8 plus a half. And again, we have the conditions that all the ni are integers and the sum is even. Um, for example, we can ask the question, how many spheres does each sphere touch? And this isn't too hard to figure out. You can see that the spheres closest to the origin of distance root two from the origin, and there are two sorts of them. We can first of all take spheres that are all zeros except for two entries that are plus or minus one. And the number of these is eight, choose two for the positions of the ones. And then we've got four choices of signs. So we get 112 of these. Or we can take plus or minus a half, plus or minus a half, up to plus or minus a half. And there are two to the eight choices of signs, except that there aren't because we have this condition the sum has to be even. So we need to divide by two and that gives 128 possibilities. And if we add them up, we see there are 240 spheres touching each sphere. Um, more generally, that's the, well, that's the number of spheres at distance root two from the origin. More generally, we can ask how many spheres are there at that distance square root of 2n from the origin. And let's call this number cn. Um, and we can form the generating function of these. We define e4 of, Q, of tau to be sum over n of cn q to the n, where q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. Um, and there's a very simple formula for this function. It's equal to 1 plus 240 sum over n of sigma 3n q to the n, where sigma 3 of n is the sum of the cubes of the divisors of n. Um, and this function here is an example of something called a modular form. So what I'll do now is explain what a modular form is. Um, so if we look at this function e4 of tau, um, let me write it as theta of tau because um, this is the theta function of a lattice. So theta has the following properties. Theta of tau plus 1 is equal to theta of tau. And this is obvious because this is true for e to the 2 pi i tau, which is equal to q, and theta is a function of q. There's a much less obvious transformation Theta of minus 1 over tau is equal to tau to the 4 times theta of tau. And why is this true? Well, it comes from the Poisson summation formula. So let's recall what this is. Suppose L is a lattice in n-dimensional space. Then the Poisson summation formula says the sum over all elements of the lattice of some function is equal to 1 over L of sum over all elements of the dual lattice of the Fourier transform. So here we have the dual of L. Sorry, that should be a lambda. So the dual of L is all vectors that have integral inner product with everything in L. This is the volume of a fundamental domain and tells you roughly how dense the lattice points are. Uh, the Fourier transform is just the integral over r to the n of e to the 2 pi i x, y of f of x dx, 
Some people like putting a sign up there. Um, and um, if we take f of x to be e to the pi i x squared tau, then and so the Fourier transform f of x is equal to tau to the 4 um, e to the minus pi i x squared over tau, then we see that the theta function is more or less given by this left hand side here. And we find that um, theta minus 1 over tau is equal to tau to the 4 times theta of tau. Um, so um, Cohen and Elkies um, use the Poisson summation formula in order to find the following sphere packing bounds. So here we have the Cohen and Elkies result. So this gives an upper bound on the density of a sphere packing. So suppose that first of all, f of x is less than or equal to zero whenever x has absolute value greater than or equal to one. Here x is um, a vector in n-dimensional space and f is any reasonably nice function on n-dimensional space. Secondly, let's suppose the Fourier transform is, sorry, that should be a zero, is always positive for all x. Um, then the density of sphere packing, that's the proportion of things inside the spheres, is at most f0 over f hat 0 times the volume of a ball of radius a half. And the proof of this is really easy, at least if we do the special case where the centers of the spheres lie on a lattice. So um, let's assume we've got a lattice um, with um, where the vectors have minimum norm at least one. Then we do the following calculation. We look at f of zero, that's greater than or equal to sum over x in L of f of x. And the reason for this is this inequality here. And now this is equal to sum over x in L prime of 1 over L times um, f hat of x. And this follows by the Poisson summation formula we mentioned earlier. And finally, this is greater than or equal to 1 over L times f hat of 0 whoops, um, by this inequality here. Um, and this gives us the result that L is greater than or equal to f of 0 over f hat of 0, which very easily gives you an upper bound for the density of a sphere packing in terms of this formula, in terms of this expression here. Um, so all you have to do in order to find an upper bound for sphere packings is find a really good function f and calculate f and its Fourier transform. And what you can do is you can take f to be something of the form e to the minus alpha x squared times a polynomial in x squared. And that sort of works. And what Elkies did was they tried this out and they got a computer to do some um, linear programming to find the best possible polynomial. And they were able to find upper bounds for lattices. And let me show you their um, picture of the upper bounds they found. So here is their picture. And um, so this is the dimension you're working in. And the vertical scale is some sort of normalized density for lattices. And this weird jagged line at the bottom is the density of the best known lattice. And you can see how complicated it is by how jagged this line is. It's, it's 
obviously a very complicated problem to find the best lattice. Now this line here is an upper bound found by Rogers many years ago, which uh, he, he showed that the best lattice, best density is, is uh, upper bound by the amount of a, of a regular simplex you can fill by putting a sphere at each vertex of the simplex. And this line here is the slightly better bound found by um, Cohen and Elkies. And now if you look um, at the point tw dimension 24 and dimension 8, the best possible lattice seems to come very close to the upper bound found by, by Cohen and Elkies. And um, they did some calculations and found that as the um, size of this pollen, as the degree of this polynomial went up, um, their upper bounds seem to be getting closer and closer to the best possible lattices in dimension 8 or 24. Um, I should mention the best lattice in dimension 24 is the famous Leach lattice and everything I say about the E8 lattice has an analogue for the Leach lattice but I'm just going to talk about the E8 la lattice because it's a bit easier. Um, and they conjectured that was in fact a function um, which showed that the best possible packing in dimension 8 and 24 is exactly the E8 or the Leach lattice. So the problem, can we find some sort of magic function f in dimensions 8 and 24 so that the upper bound is equal to the lower bound given by the E8 lattice and the Leach lattice. Um, and um, um, Henry Cohn went around asking lots of people this. In fact, he, he, he sort of mentioned this problem to me and I, I thought about it for a few hours and got absolutely nowhere. I tried a few ideas and they all just failed completely and I just couldn't think of anything to do and gave up. And I imagine a lot of other people did much the same. Um, and it was like that for several years until Marina Vyazovska um, managed to find, um, find this completely amazing solution. So what I'm going to do is, is um, the rest of this lecture I'll be giving a rough sketch of what she did. So the problem, we want to find a function g on R8 with, first of all, um, g of x is less than or equal to 0 for x having absolute value greater than or equal to the square root of 2. I'm putting the square root of 2 rather than 1 here because the E8 lattice has minimal norm the square root of 2, so you sort of need to renormalize Cohen and Elke's results slightly. And we want g hat of x is greater than or equal to 0, and we want g of 0 equals g hat of 0 equals 1. So the problem is, can you find a function on, in eight dimensions with these properties? How on earth do you go about finding such a function? Well, first of all, we can make some simplifying assumptions. We can assume, first of all, g depends only on the absolute value of x or x squared if you prefer. Um, that's because there's no harm in assuming g is invariant under rotation. So it's really only a function of one variable which makes things a lot easier. Um, we can also assume that um, g of x is equal to g hat of x equals 0 for x in the E8 lattice. And that's because if we look at the proof of the Cohn and Elke's result, we want, actually want to have equality here um, because we want the, 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 the best possible case. So, so we must actually have equality. And this means that f must actually vanish if x is in the lattice. And similarly, it must vanish, uh, the, 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 the Fourier transform must also vanish if x is in the lattice and not zero. Um, so this gives us a sort of initial picture of what the graphs of G and its Fourier transform must look like. So here's the absolute value of X. 
and G must sort of look like this. So here we have root 2, root 4, root 6 and so on as, as the zeros. So this is going to be G and G hat must look something like this. And um, um, in particular, the functions must have zeros at these points. In the case of G hat, it has to be a double zero. And in the case of G, it has to be a single zero at root two and double zeros elsewhere. Um, well, that gives us a little bit of information about them, but it doesn't really help all that much. So what Marina Vyazowska did was she wrote G of x as a function of two other functions, pi i over 8640. These are just random normalization constants, which aren't very significant, times a of x plus i over 240 pi times b of x. So what are a and b? Well, a is sort of even under the Fourier transform. So if you write f for the Fourier transform, it means a hat is equal to a. And b has to be sort of odd under the Fourier transform, which means b hat equals minus b. So we can always decompose g like that. And the problem is what are a and b? So the Fourier transform g hat is going to be this thing minus this thing, of course. And now comes the clever bit. We're going to write a of r, where, where we're now going to think of a as being just a function of the radius, is going to be minus 4 sine pi r squared over 2 squared times the integral from 0 to infinity of z squared e to the pi i r squared z times um, phi 0 of minus 1 over z dz. OK, so what on earth is going on here? Well, um, this bit here forces zeros of a. Um, I should say, and this only converges for r greater than root 2. For r less than root, to root 2, you have to uh, be a little bit more careful about how you define it. And what is phi 0? Well, this is a sort of quasi-modular form. sort of like a modular form, only, only more so. And this thing here is a Laplace transform, more or less. So um, the, 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 the sort of, the, the key idea is to write A of R as this function that forces the zeros times the Laplace transform of a of a, of a certain modular form, which we have to figure out. And there's a similar formula for B of R, so it's going to be minus 4 sine pi r squared over 2 squared times the integral of 0 to infinity of e to the pi i r squared z times psi of z dz, where this is going to be another quasi-modular form. And again, this bit here is going to force the necessary zeros of b. And the fact that we've got a quasi-modular form here means that psi or, or, or phi zero satisfy a certain functional equation and it's going to be this that implies a hat equals a and b hat equals minus b. So the, 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 the behavior of a and b um, under Fourier transforms is, turns out to be follow from the fact that these are quasi-modular forms. So the next question is, what are um, phi zero and psi? And let me write down the expressions for them and then explain what on earth is going on. So phi zero is given as follows. We take 1728e4 squared over e4 cubed minus e6 squared um, plus 2e2 times minus 1728 e4 e6 over e4 
cubed minus e6 squared plus 1728 e4 cubed over e4 cubed minus e6 squared minus 1728, where e2 is equal to 1 minus 24 times the sum of sigma 1 n q to the n, e4 is equal to 1 plus 240 times sum of sigma 3 n q to the n, and e6 is equal to 1 minus 504 times sum of sigma 5 n of q to the n. And you take a look at this and you think, Irk, where on earth did this expression come from? Um, well, it's not quite as weird as it looks. First of all, an awful lot of these bits and pieces are fairly standard functions that occur in modular form theory. So these things here are just Eisenstein series, which are really basic functions that everyone who works in modular forms knows about. Um, these funny combinations of Eisenstein series are also fairly standard. For example, this is in fact the so-called elliptic modular function, j, which is again a standard function. Um, these are also fairly standard functions. Um, um, uh, sorry, there should be a factor of e2 squared in there. Um, as I, probably nobody noticed, I missed it out. Um, so this thing here and this thing here are also fairly standard functions. Roughly speaking, they're, they're certain modular forms of negative weight with a pole of order 1 or 2 at infinity. I mean, the expressions for them look like a bit of a mess, but um, there's a good reason for all that. Um, and these, this funny linear combination of these functions is chosen so that um, um, phi zero um, um, has vanishing coefficients of um, q to the minus two, q to the minus one, q to the zero. So in order to, um, if you take a linear combination of these, it would normally have terms in q to the minus 2, q to the minus 1, q to the 0, so on, and you adjust this funny looking linear combination in order to cancel out all these coefficients. So there is, um, in, in spite of the extraordinarily weird expression for phi 0, there, there, it is actually in some sense a, a fairly natural function. It's almost a modular form, or rather a modular function. In other words, it's almost invariant under tau goes to a tau plus b over c tau plus d. Um, explain what almost means is a little bit complicated and I'm just going to skip it. Um, well, that was phi zero. Um, I should say that the definition of phi zero is not really the hard part of, of, of the proof of this. The hard part is coming up with with the idea of having sine squared this times a Laplace transform of a, of a quasi-modular form. Um, I mean, putting the sine squared here is one of these things that looks like a kind of dumb idea at first, but turns out to be a stroke of genius. And the same for the Laplace transform. Um, once you've had this idea of writing sine squared of this times a Laplace transform, um, Finding phi zero is really just a sort of long but routine calculation. You could kind of give it to any expert in modular forms. They'd probably find this phi zero after a few days of calculation. So, so the, the, the really key part of the proof is coming up with the general form of this function. And the rest is sort of laborious but straightforward. Well, not quite straightforward, but whatever. It's not... Not, 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 not the difficult part of the proof. Um, I, I'll just show you what, what, what the function um, psi is. It's an equally bizarre looking function. It looks like 128 theta 0, 0 to the 4 plus theta 0, 1 to the 4 over theta 1, 0 to the 8 um, plus theta 0, 
1 to the 4 minus theta 1 0 to the 4 over theta 0 0 to the 8. And again, these are fairly standard functions in the theory of modular forms. Th th these thetas are theta functions, so this is just sum over n q to the n squared over 2. Theta 0 1 is sum of minus 1 to the n q to the n squared over 2, and theta 1 0 is sum over n q to the n plus a half squared over 2. And, and again, these are all very standard, well-known functions. Um, so once you've written down um, a of r and b of r in this rather complicated explicit form, the rest of the proof is just calculation. First of all, you've got to check that a and b satisfy these relations here, which is, as I said, is a calculation using the fact that these are modular forms. And secondly, you've got to check the positivity conditions for G and its Fourier transform G hat. And again, this is a certain amount of hard work, but there's nothing too difficult in it once you've got the explicit expressions for, for A and B. Um, OK, so um, that's how you prove the um, best possible sphere pack in eight dimensions. Um, this result was generalized very shortly afterwards to 24 dimensions and shows the Leech lattice is also best possible. But all dimensions greater than three other than eight and 24, we still haven't been able to prove anything. So there's a completely open problem. Can you find some way to generalize this to other dimensions?